Brambro back with some Grand Tacticians Civil War. Union Campaign. And the 1.07 Beta. And I think we're seeing some interesting things in 1.07. So, where are we at now? We're in late September 1861. So... Winter is uh, approaching, but not uh, still over a month away. And campaigns are still active in the various theaters. Um, for getting to the armies, I'll put out, uh, I'll mention that uh, I built a ton of frigates right at the campaign start. <laughs> Something like 20 of them. I, it's a huge amount. Yeah. Uh, these were, these three are campaign start ships that uh, just needed to repair. So that's happening. And as, as these repair, uh, Sabine, Franklin, Pensacola, um, these are just going to fold into the blockade fleets. And I, uh, I went around and looked at the various ports, Confederate ports, to see which blockade fleet needed the most in terms of... I had been looking at number of ships, number of guns, but the right metric to look at, I think, is which Confederate ports have the uh, lowest blockade percentage. So that's what I'm looking at now. It seems pretty obvious. I should have done that a long time ago. And uh, Charleston blockade right now, and those are important. You know, that's that fleet covers both Charleston and Savannah as well as Port Royal. So those are two bit, two pretty big ports, uh, plus another. And so uh, they're, and that's the fleet, they're only at 30%. So uh, as these ships uh, get repaired, they're gonna go to the Charleston blockade, I think. You know, we get a, we get this tool, t uh, this little icon up here, enemy blockades, Hampton blockade efficiency, 11%, right? So that there's an icon here that tells you your own ports and what the percentages are. I think it would be cool if there were a similar icon that showed us the enemy ports and how well we are blockading them. You know, something just like this, only listing the CSA ports. That would be helpful, I think, and reasonable. I mean, we're getting the information anyway on the campaign map. It would just be nice to have it collected up in a tooltip up here. Um, you know, I mean, there's a there's an icon for Confederate invasions and Union invasions. Why can't there be one for Confederate blockade and Union blockade? All right. All these other frigates, and some of them will go into blockade fleets too. <laughs> I may have overdone it a little bit, but uh, I I am using I am going to use these for um, busting forts. Eventually, if any, you know, if any seagoing uh, Confederate fl fleet ever pops up somewhere that causes problems that the blockade fleets themselves can't handle. I think that's a pretty unlikely scenario, but uh, yeah, you know, we could put together a battle squadron of those frigates for that. But until then, they're going to be busting forts, right? Because the CSA has a lot of coastal forts that frigates can get to all along here that then, you know, they, those forts protect quite a number of ports. And it's one thing, of course, uh, you know, it's one thing to blockade a port and even reach 100%. But uh, my perception has always been that even at 100%, right? 100%, as far as I've ever been able to tell, doesn't mean you are absolutely stopping all trade whatsoever right the trade here is zero for this port i don't think that's what 100 percent blockade means i think 100 percent means 
this port is blockaded as fully as completely as is possible. I think there's still blockade running that goes on at 100% and some amount still gets through. That's my perception. I don't necessarily, you know, I don't necessarily have data that I can show right here to back that up, but that's my impression. Because you can have a, a port that's blockaded showing 100% and then you click on it, right? Like this and get the... Uh, I can get the port. There we go. You know, and it's still showing sales tax and tariffs and stuff coming in and stuff coming out and stuff getting sold and and it's reduced a lot, but uh, you know, these numbers don't become zero at 100% blockade. Therefore, even better than blockading, is actually capturing the port. Now that would mean coming up with a whole bunch of little armies and coming down and, and capturing Wilmington and Charleston and Savannah and Port Royal and Fernandina. And that would be a pretty big manpower commitment and those forces would remain fairly vulnerable. However, Something I want to try, and Norfolk is going to be a test case, right? This is an experiment. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> okay. Let's be clear about that. When these uh, frigates become available, and I'm going to form a fleet of them, and I have so many because ships get beat up bombarding forts, right? Even when successful... It takes them a while to repair and so I've got a ton of frigates so I can just rotate them in and out right and keep that fleet moving and and not uh, get slowed down a lot by having to repair what I'm gonna see if we can do is come down here bombard Fort Norfolk and then there is a perk called Amphibious Assault. And and Perk Slot XP ramps up pretty good when it... I think it's broken for blockading. Like, okay, Virginia Blockade's been sitting here for... since the start of the campaign, blockading, and has built zero XP. So I don't think... Block, there's something that's not working right with uh, getting XP from blockading. But for bombarding a fort, it'll ramp up pretty fast. And a fleet bombarding a fort will probably open its perk slot before that bombardment is complete. This amphibious assault perk ostensibly allows the fleet to have a chance not a certainty, a chance of actually capturing the fort on its own without needing land troops. Now, for the longest time, you could get the perk, but the amphibious assault chance was always uniformly zero. Zero. You could see it in the battle feed, right? Amphibious assault attempted chance, 0.0. .0. Uh, they have tinkered with that recently, and the chance is no longer zero. It can happen. Um, I know many people watching this channel probably watch uh, V Logging Through History, and he's got a Union campaign going, and uh, I was pleasantly shocked in uh, one of his recent episodes, I think the most recent episode at the time I'm recording this, where he had a fleet capture a fort. That's super cool! So, uh... I had kind of abandoned that idea for a while, because yeah, I used to try that all the time in earlier Union campaigns, um, but now that uh, they've adjusted that perk and have seen, and we've seen, uh, you know, empirical evidence that it can work, at least occasionally, I'm going to try it here and see if I can get a frigate fleet to both beat up this fleet, James River Squadron, which is very small, um, and capture Fort Norfolk. 
And then the second experiment is going to be if a fort comes under your control this close to a city, will the fort itself put out enough territory, zone of control influence to actually capture the city on its own? Fort Norfolk, at least, certainly looks like it ought to be close enough to do that. So, we'll see if that happens. Now, down here, like Wilmington has, well, Wilmington's got a pretty close fort here at Fort Fisher, but it's not quite as close. Um... If we were to do the same at Fort Fisher, I'm not 100% sure that Wilmington would be captured. But maybe the maybe the port would be. I mean, if Fort Fisher were Union, and that made the Wilmington port Union, that would essentially accomplish the same goal. So anyway... That's something I'm going to try. I don't know if it's going to work. All right, I've spent enough about enough time talking about naval plans. Uh, our lumber yard and our salt works are getting pretty close to being completed. Now, as soon as that lumber mill up here is immediately completed, I, I don't know if that's the point at which we may need to let it produce for a while and build up a local supply of wood before we see any... Uh, price differential at the port at Buffalo. Okay, so what's going on in the various theaters? Um, I think just the same as our, you know, just a recap here. Not too much going on in Virginia. Both Confederate armies are down here at uh, Gordonsville, uh, and I think they're still building a supply depot here. No? Yeah, they're still building a supply depot here. And McDowell's Army recently defeated Jubal Early uh, up here at Harper's Ferry, and he's just coming back over here to the other side of the Blue Ridge to Culpeper Courthouse. And he should be within, well within supply range of this uh, supply depot here. McClellan is uh, coming via rail and river down here to this position. In Ohio, just across from Point Pleasant, and from here he will move toward Charleston, uh, which probably means that he will wind up uh, engaging this Confederate army under Garnet on the way. This is the Western Department Administrative Command Recruiting Command, and I'm moving him down here to Louisville. Uh, to the Indiana side of the river at Louisville, and that's really just because there is no supply depot at Indianapolis, and I don't want to build one, and there is a supply depot uh, at Louisville, and he'll be, from here, he'll be close enough to draw supplies from it, because sometimes the recruiting commands will actually have a fair number of troops in them before they are transferred forward. And actually, I think there are a fair number of troops in the Western Department. Uh, yeah, you can see here, there's 90, almost 9,400 men actually here that have arrived, and I haven't decided entirely what to do with them yet. Lyons, Missouri Army has once again uh, gotten sight of the Missouri State Guard. It's just sitting right here at Lebanon. It's still apparently pretty small with no brigades inbound to it. But as I've mentioned before, the role of this army is essentially defensive in Missouri. Uh, the objective in Missouri is just not to lose St. Louis. So I don't know if I really want to go press in on the Missouri State Guard. I think I'm happy just uh, with Lyon sitting here drawing supplies at uh, Rolla. Which brings us to Tennessee. So in the last episode, Grant fought a battle against Polk, and it was pretty interesting. Um, 
It was a defensive situation. The onus was on Polk to attack, and Polk did something that I don't think I have seen in 1.0 uh, prior to 1.07. Uh, Polk did move up to position and did make an attack with just a couple of units, which failed, naturally, because it was a Ford. And, uh, and then Polk decided, well, this, is, this just isn't going to work, and decided to withdraw. And usually that... AI withdraw or retreat decision doesn't come until they're close to meeting the 22% uh, uh, major victory threshold, right? 22% uh, casualties taken threshold. Polk didn't wait for that. Uh, this army had about 10% casualties, and the uh, you know the little status bar up here for victory and defeat had not. It, it was getting fairly close, but it was not... It, there was still quite a distance to go before reaching the end, which is where the retreat decision is normally triggered in a battle. So he did not take that many casualties and had not reached the end of the uh, status bar and decided to retreat, thereby preserving more of his army and ensuring that we could only get a minor victory. And uh, I think that's pretty good for AI decision making. I think it was the right decision for him to make. Um, possibly even a better decision for him to, to have made w would have been just to see the, the disparity in the true count and retreat at the beginning. But, you know, what the AI did there was, I, I thought, pretty good. You know, he didn't just, like, sacrifice his army in a forlorn assault um, against insurmountable odds. So I think that's an improvement. And what we've got now is, okay, and also, he didn't have to retreat very far as a result. He was withdrawing, not retreating, and... Really, he only had to, I think, under that circumstance, he didn't have to retreat all the way back to a Confederate-held IIP. He only had to break contact, right? Where you get that uh, rearguard action, uh, so-and-so's army has slipped away. That's as far as he had to go. So that allowed us to capture Nashville, which we have done. But Polk is still sitting here on the outskirts of Nashville. And Grant doesn't yet have the latitude to proceed to his next objective of starting to uh, besiege these forts up here. At the moment, Grant's got to stay here. So we need to chase Polk away a little bit more. And that's what we're going to do right now. Now... We just came out of that battle. Time hasn't advanced. So uh, Grant's supply situation is not good. He's run out of food for both men and horses. <laughs> but what he does have is he's still got a lot of ammo. Uh, in the 80s for both. Didn't, you know, didn't use much ammo in that battle either. So let's go use some more of that ammo and get Polk out of here. I don't think we need any of these movement things. We just need to get up close enough to engage Polk again. And then what I think I'm going to do is, uh, once Polk is chased away, I'm probably going to have Grant's army go ahead and construct a fort here at Nashville. All right. Oh, wait a minute. It, no, I, I'm going to leave him in an offensive stance. So we may need to, to make an... Yeah. We'll probably get an, a, an attacking battle next. And with 17,000 against 10,000. Hopefully we can catch him before he gets those extra 3,000 men. So this battle may not... May be a little bit harder. 
especially considering quite a few of Grant's brigades are still smoothbore armed. Okay. Yeah, we're catching him with 10,000 men. We've got 17,000. I tend to think you get various numbers for enemy troop numbers based on intel. On this window, it's and they're usually rounded off to a, you know, a number that ends in zero. I tend to think that this display right here is probably one of the most accurate uh, that one can get. We have the option of going into siege, which we could then convert into a tactical battle by using the assault option, which I think would increase the chance that we fight a defensive battle. But knowing what we know now about AI behavior, when they are attacking with a big uh, disparate, you know, a big disadvantage in troop numbers, I don't know if that's really going to do that much for us. I think, however, by getting a defensive situation, what we can do is choose the ground and prevent the enemy from building fortifications during the deployment phase. Right? So they're going to come up, have a look, decide not to attack, but they're not going to have fortifications. So it gives us a better position for us to attack right? We're sitting there in the breastworks and it's like, okay, well, okay, you're here now <laughs> with no parapets, so now we're going to attack. One could play it that way, too. Matter of fact, I'm going to be cheesy and I'm going to do it that way. Bring your gaming the system. Yep. <laughs> I'm just exploring what's possible. See what works, what doesn't. Okay, now let's switch to the assault. Switch to the assault. Well, it's not grayed out. Why is that not working? Oh, maybe I need to go to the. Yeah, maybe I need to do it this way. There we go. I didn't even look at the status bar at the bottom. Maybe maybe it would have been perfectly viable just to leave it the way it was. Maybe the siege was way in our favor. <laughs> I didn't even look. Man, that's quite a beard that fellow's got. Who's that? Albert Jenkins. How many years do you think it takes to develop a beard like that? Five years? Okay. Meeting situation. Fair enough. Where is the objective? Well, it's up here kind of close to us. Uh-huh. And where is the Confederate entry point? Down here at Salem and also over here on the Franklin Road. This is actually pretty similar to uh, the previous battle. Except the in that case, the objective was over here on this side of Stones River. So it's a little bit farther away, however, um, it is still pretty clear that we will get to it before the CSA does by crossing 
at these fords up here and coming over this way. However, it is far enough away, unlike last time, that we can't really... Uh, I don't think we're going to have as much time to build any kind of defensive position. Anyway, I'm going to get uh, the army set up and... Uh, it's going to be some marching to do, a little bit of scouting to do, and I will be back. Okay, so the army spread out a little bit. Uh, one division crossing here, one division crossing here, another division crossing here, along with the artillery division. Okay, and cav are in position down here to come across and start scouting over here. Ideally, what I hope happens, the objective is to try to get over in this area and establish uh, our position kind of anchored on the right by Overall Creek, anchored on the left by these woods, and a fence line across here with open ground in front of us. Now that may not work out that way. Um, I'm kind of thinking that the Rebs are probably going to kind of come over this way and are going to want to come at the objective along this way. If that happens, then probably division along in here, uh, or yeah, probably in here, would be the best way to go. So I think uh, probably Prentice's division will bring him over to here, establish a position right here facing this way, and then we'll bring the other divisions over to what I described, but then they're in a uh, position to swing around and extend the line to, well, to the south, I guess it would be. That's the idea. We'll see how it works out. Okay, so this is, again, fairly interesting. Um, so the Confederate spawn position was somewhere down here, and I didn't really notice before, there's a nice straight road coming all the way up this way. And that's this is the route that Johnny Reb is taking. I thought he would kind of come up through here and then come at the objective this way. Nope, he's coming from this direction. That does oblige him to attack across this creek and whether he intends to cross here or here not yet clear um, so that's the latest development and I will be back I also need to kind of be careful with this cab over here so now they're caught behind the revs <laughs> okay more to follow Okay, so things are developing pretty good here. Johnny Reb's coming down this road, but he's made the turn. The lead elements have turned right onto this road, so clearly they're headed for this Asbury Church Ford. Uh, Lytle's division is uh, moving to block that right here. But, you know, the whole... The goal here is not to create this impregnable defensive position, which would have been my natural inclination pretty much the entire time I've been playing this game. <laughs> but we know now that, well, Polk may not take the bait on that. He didn't last time. He did a little bit. He tested the defenses, and then he beat feet. That's not what we want here. So Lytle's division, two brigades, and he's got and I detect and he's got his uh, I'll put his uh, artillery over here. They should be pretty safe there, at least from being charged because of the creek. So these guys are going to hold the uh, creek a little bit. I need to get them into single line as soon as they get here. It may get a little messy, uh, but I'm bringing the other two divisions across the creek, and they are going to attack across open ground this way 
I think that's what we need to do in order to get this smaller force, smaller opponent, fully engaged. Uh, Hamilton's already across, and in let me uh, detach his battery there. No, it's already detached. Yeah, okay. And I uh, need to do the same. Where is Prentice's? Let's attach him to. Because I don't want the batteries moving ahead with the infantry. As soon as uh, Prentice is in place, uh, we get him up here. Uh, they're going to come right across here and do them. And hopefully by that time, these brigades are focused on trying to get across the fort here at Asbury. That's the, uh, let's see, I've also got some calf here. What's this calf doing? Let's bring this calf back over this way. May not be able to do anything, but let's put him in a position to make a contribution from over this side. If such an opportunity presents itself, it may not. <clears throat> and then we've got this other calf back here. Just kind of keep him a watch on him. Okay. A bit more marching to do, but we're getting closer to uh, shots fired in anger. Okay. Polk is making an attack here. Uh, he's advancing on this Ford. Uh, had some skirms out here. There's a screen. Lytle's getting his guys into single line. Hopefully they kind of do that a little bit quicker. I did notice there's one little battery bringing up the rear here. I'm trying to, trying to see if this cab unit can come pop this guy and route it before it gets help. I don't know if it's going to... Not moving very fast. I don't know if that's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've just got these skirmishers over here kind of buying a little time for uh, uh, let's get these guys up in the woods cover about like so they only have well they got rifles I think they'll be okay These divisions are moving forward, or should be soon, as soon as the order delay lets them, bringing the artillery up to about here as well. Rifled artillery. I think they'll be in range from around this area. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Those must be some awfully slow horses they're sitting on. Okay. It's just, uh, that didn't work. Just, just come here. That's fine. Before you go and get yourself in trouble. Well, these artillery have wandered a little close to uh, these other skirmishers that were over here just keeping an eye on things. Meg, she got skirms out? No. Which one up here and she did some Marty.
Okay. Yeah, Johnny Reb kind of sees now. Polk sees. Uh oh. <laughs> There's some dudes coming from over there. He's not that interested in the Ford anymore. Which means. Now these are the this brigade is rifle armed. No. I just noticed MacArthur has got Mississippi's. Mississippi's would have been good over here if I had noticed that. But these guys are rifle armed. Maybe we can move them up just enough where they can fire across the river. The creek. Cab up across the creek to about here. No, that's a bad spot. There's a fence in the way. Close enough where he can just stay out of trouble, keep an eye on things, but still be able to do something, perhaps. Are you in march order? What is that about? It's wanted to put him in column over here. He's in line formation. And the army com the army default position is line formation, double line. And for some reason, Prentice's uh, position over here is going to put him in column. That doesn't make any sense. not quite in range yet, but if they move any closer, ooh, I may have moved this calf a little bit too close. A little bit too close. We'll see. Okay, these skirms are coming in. That's fine. Some artillery starting to engage over here. Uh, a battery of Napoleons. here we have 12 pound field guns there's a battery of 10 pounder parrots they'll certainly be in range two batteries of 10 pounder parrots and they're almost in position okay Wool is engaged now. In forest cover. Kearney's in forest cover, but he's just got muskets. This battalion, or battery, 24 pound howitzers, engaged, firing. One battery routed. I'm going to move 3rd Division forward, but I, I want Prentice up in position first. Move two divisions together. Would obviously be preferred. I think we might be able to snag this uh, battalion after all. He doesn't have too much infantry near him. 
All right, come on, more. Let's see if you can do something here. And ring. All right. Get him. Oh, rear flanked. I thought they had turned around. I guess they didn't. I'll put those manners to good use. get across the ford over here now. Arkansas State troops wavering. They haven't taken enormous losses. Let's just move Kearney up just a little bit. Just so he gets in range. there anyway. Okay, those guys are routed. Go ahead and advance. <laughs> Third division, one of which has Mississippis and the other has muskets, so they have a huge range <laughs> differential. <laughs> that, that's not so great. Okay, I think all this artillery is engaged back here. Kearney firing, Kearney is firing. From an angle which gives uh, Van Dorn uh, a flanked debuff, so that works out. Rotate wool just a little bit here. Make sure he doesn't get flanked himself. Probably need to get Grant on the other side of the river. Let's do that. I think I'm unlikely to give a divisional level command to Lytle. Van Dorn has come up far enough here that he's getting benefit from forest cover as well. That kind of sucks. Let's bring this cab up over here.
king, what are you doing, man? Even your position is in line. You're not moving. I don't know how that's going to turn out. There he goes. Okay. They're, they're getting back into line. It's just they're going to be doing it under fire. There. Let's go ahead and distract this brigade <laughs> while Prentice forms up. What are we doing here? thousand to about 450 and we're getting close to 10 percent and look at this bar right it's almost to the end when they are still below 10 percent casualties that seems new as well i think it's going to be harder even when you're attacking i think it's going to be harder to achieve major victories now which is probably good and i think you know with the lower uh, casualty counts in battles like this, I think that's going to mean that the enemy uh, national morale is going to drop a little bit slower. Yeah, that would make sense, right? And let's see. Donaldson is not broken. I probably don't want second cav engaging him. Let's get him. Now, I don't really want to give second cav just a free pass out of here. However, I also don't want this little 480-man uh, cav unit to take a volley from 2,300 troops in the face. <laughs> Either. Okay. Wool took some losses, but it has dropped him to stable, and he's actually wavering now. And he doesn't have any morale debuffs down here, right? He's got a morale buff from being close to his commander. He's got a morale buff from being close to uh, Kearney's brigade, right? Friendly units nearby. He's getting, he's getting a morale buff from being behind cover. And he's getting a morale buff from the presence of Confederate routed units nearby. He ought to be doing hunky-dory. He has taken 272 losses. Yet he's only just stable and dropping. Interesting. Oh, it is early in the campaign, right? The the units don't have uh, the experience levels yet, which help counteract that sort of thing. There's still green troops, right? Training poor. It's only their second battle. Meanwhile, let's move uh, Kearney up. Fire on that cab there. And there's no other unbroken units in this vicinity. Let's have uh, Rowley, Rally, Rowley. Let's go with Rally. Let's have Rally's uh, second cab come and. Put some fire on this calf here. Okay, let's make sure that this Mississippi Arm Brigade continues on. No, don't march in column. Jeez. What happens if I just advance you? No. And I don't know how to turn that off, right? I mean, he's in line. 
choose formation to eat line, but if I give them an order, it's going to be in column, despite being at line at the brigade, division, and army level. But it wants to put them in column. All right, well, let's do it this way. Here, just go shoot that guy. That'll make you stay in line, won't it? these cabs to come fire at these guys. Did I not? Kearney's engaged. And it looks like wool is still stable, but black text, not orange text, which means he's not continuing to drop. It's a stable stable, if you will. <laughs> So we've got two different units putting fire on uh, bait here. Hopefully that... And let's have more charge. No, this unit's broken, so he should be able to charge these guys and capture a few fellas without taking casualties. Be the hook. So slow! <laughs> and it doesn't you know it doesn't adjust the path onto the unit it just goes to the position for the charge oh nothing's here what do you want us to do now okay keep shooting at him if you can Oh, this brigade's about to get caught. And actually, I don't think we want our cap there for that. We want this guy sandwiched in between uh, infantry. Would have been better if uh, Kear Kearney, Kearney were uh, rifle armed. But I think this unit's going to have to get a lot closer for him to be able to shoot. It's almost in range of uh, wool. Well, see if you can manage to charge this uh, artillery over here. Can you manage that? Probably not. Well, this is about to get interesting over here. just going to phase through them as an unbroken unit. There is no these guys.
Okay, that infantry brigade is broken now. There is a fence here that could mess the cab up. Typically, not big fans of fences. Eighteen point four per cent. No, not in melee. Keep trying. You'll get it eventually. Nope. There we go. They're in melee. Should do a little... No, not anymore. the other calf. I think this will all be over by the time we get over here. None of this infantry is going to catch any of these units over here. If we're going to get anything done at all, it's going to be with a calf, and <laughs> they're not doing very much. Nope, I had the wrong unit there. You tell them to charge a unit, and they're not actually charging the unit. They're going to a position on the ground. And if there happen to be troops there, when they get there, yeah, they'll melee them. But they won't pursue. Or usually they won't pursue. Sometimes they do. I've never figured out what the difference is. Occasionally they'll stick with it. Usually they do this. I'm not sure they're actually, even in these really short uh, melees, when they manage to get one at all, I'm not sure they're actually capturing anybody for additional casualties. And anyway, there's only three minutes left. Okay. I wonder if they would do better if I've had them in attack column formation. Okay, minor federal victory. 1900 so, about 19% casualties. Did lose all of his guns. And uh, at this stage of the war, 400 cavalry losses is pretty big. That's basically a brigade's worth. So still a minor, but we put a bigger hurt on Polk in this battle than we did in the one prior at a cost of 500. Not a single man lost in either uh, cab, and we didn't lose any guns. All right.
I don't think we had anybody route. There shouldn't be any defamations on our side. Yeah, see a little bit bigger national morale drop there because of the higher casualty percentage. But still not up to 1.0 or higher, which is what one typically gets with a, a major victory. There isn't actually a difference between major and minor as on their own for the national morale and the military experience. It's just that the major victory the definition is it's is the higher casualty count the percentage so i think this national morale uh however much it is will scale with the casualty percentage and uh probably absolute number of casualties as well because it tends to be significantly higher for larger battles as well okay uh well yeah so all that Cav nonsense, and we managed to capture 18 <laughs> troops that have gone to the POW camps. Almost a thousand small arms and seven guns. Yeah, and see, last battle, Polk was withdrawing in the newspaper headline, and this time he is fleeing in panic. So we should run further away this time. He still doesn't have to go that far. He's probably only going to go as far as Pulaski. Okay, he slipped away. This is still... Yeah, Pulaski is still Confederate on, so I'm pretty sure it's where he's going. So, as described earlier, I am going to go ahead and... Yeah, he's getting nice... Grant's getting nice supply now. 100% provisions and forage restocked from this depot. And apparently a little bit from Columbia as well. So as described earlier, I am going to get Grant's army building a fort at Nashville. And right there I think we'll do. 12 million for that fort. So we're probably going to pop down a credit rating uh, notch. But we had, but we're at AAA. I mean, the government budget's doing pretty good here. I'm trying to get There we go. 31 days. It's not bad. I think that will do for this episode. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like the content, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. At any rate, uh, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it.